Elon Musk wants to merge man and machine. So we're going to take a look at that tonight with something that uh, you'll find in Rudolf Steiner's works, the esoteric works called Anthroposophy. He talks about a future where we will need to weld mankind and machine, or the human nature and the machine nature. So the title of tonight's talk is Rudolf Steiner's Surprising View of the Future. Now, I just want to give a slight introduction. I started back in the early 1990s doing lectures. And I found when I first started, it was really a powerful lecture if I could scare the pants off of people. They <laughs> loved to be scared about the coming drama from technology. And I did one on nanotechnology, and, and I could scare people with all the dangers from silver nanoparticles getting into our waterways and all that. It is a danger, and so is technology. And many anthroposophists have been, I don't think this is a good thing, this technology. And our Waldorf schools have been sort of proud of the fact that the kids are sort of screen free until maybe eighth grade, although that's changing. But a lot of the owners and high executives of Waldorf schools out in Silicon Valley and Sonoma area send their kids to Waldorf schools. And they're actually proud of the fact that their kids are getting a childhood and not getting the screen time right away. In 1998, that was quite a eventful year during the, uh, the dot-com boom, but it's also three times 666 for those of you into that stuff. Um, I, one morning, got up and I had this awful feeling about a talk I had just done. And I realized what was happening in me was that I wasn't giving people anything but the fear. And that the fear, and I went down and verified this right away that same day, actually helps those forces that in anthroposophy we call Araman which is the Prince of Darkness. And I then st immediately started changing the tone. And once I realized that, every Steiner lecture I picked up was now different. I read them totally differently, and something dramatic happened for me. But it wasn't until about 2005 that I was able to now give some of the content that you're going to hear today. I finally got it enough to make a lecture. So it took seven years from that moment. Um, so when I mentioned this welding together, it actually begs the question, was Rudolf Steiner what we might call a proto-transhumanist? Now, if, for those who aren't familiar with the term a transhumanist, it is those very people who got initiated, in a sense, by Marvin Minsky at MIT's AI lab towards believing that we, us carbon creatures, sorry, I hit the mic, are going to, because of our biological frailties, go away in the course of evolution. But our silicon creation will carry on the highest ideals and aims of humanity. And now there's all sorts of, of these transhumanists who believe that this transition in humanity is well underway. And we'll talk more about that when we get to those. So uh, a lot of these futurologists are making a lot of money talking and writing books about how we're going to what kind of attachments we can have. Um, will machines and robotics take over? What about artificial intelligence? Is it good for us? And I'll mention Ray Kurzweil because of his seminal book called uh, The Singularity is Near, where he talks about this exponential rise in the intelligence and capabilities of computers. And when you plot that out, 
around the year 2035 to 2050, machines will exceed the intellectual capacity of a human being. And by the year 2050, one $2,000 machine will exceed the intellectual capacity of all human beings on the earth. Yeah, that's in today's <laughs> dollars, probably. Right, good question. So we'll take a look at Rudolf Steiner in particular, occult science, to see how that might map towards this. And I think you're going to find things quite interesting. Uh, in particular, the separation of the moon from Earth evolution. And then what's going to be happening uh, from today to the sixth millennium, and then from there to the eighth millennium. The longer term picture in anthroposophy or spiritual science is the next planetary stage, which in esoteric works is called Jupiter. Um, it's not the planet, that is a planetary condition or stage where uh, what we call Earth today will disappear before that, and another, you might call it solar system, will come into existence. And that whole solar system with its various planets and so on will be called Jupiter, or is called today Jupiter for what will be in that time. And in esoteric lore, this path to that has already begun because we have passed the point of the middle of evolution, and now devolution is beginning. So, and then we'll have a quick conclusion, and then we'll move into a workshop tomorrow to delve more deeply into this welding together and look at what is possible and what is being looked at. So, I want to ask you all, what is your picture for after 2050? You've heard what some of these futurologists have said. What would be your picture of a sustainable future where humanness and the human being are still the forefront of evolution? How can we have a humane future? Well, for some of you, this is the picture. Do you see it's a horse and buggy and a guy sitting on it? Uh, pretty much a picture from about the 1870s, 1880s. Some of you may have this picture, which is a picture of the Jetsons going around in their own sort of flymobile. And then some of you may have this warning picture, which is the cover of The Matrix, the movie, and uh, all the other sort of scary movies about the future. And that's exactly what I don't want to do, is have you walk out tonight afraid of the future. But I have to talk about it and what is coming. So the question is, how can we continue being human with what we can foresee coming in technology? So we will be in an age of artificial intelligence. MIT professor Max Tegart has a book out recently called Life 3.0, the subtitle Being Human in the Age of Artificial Intelligence. NPR has had a number, uh, has had an interview, and other radio stations yeah. have had them. And it's quite interesting to hear some of the things he has to say. He is the founder of the Future of Life Institute. Mm -hmm. And he describes how will artificial intelligence affect jobs, our justice system, crime, war, society, in our very sense of being human. And it's interesting to note that um, <clears throat> the first uh, citizenship ever granted to a robot just happened a, a week ago to the robot named Sophia. And she was granted citizenship in Saudi Arabia, where she was at the Futures Investment Conference as one of its keynote speakers. So, Saudi Arabia. And there are other articles just out this week 
Should robots be given citizenship? Should they be allowed to vote? Should they be accorded any rights that are currently human rights? It begs the question, what is human about the human being? What makes us different? And one of the things we'll be talking about tomorrow more is what are these robotics, what are they not? By what they're not, we can learn what we are because we have no clue anymore who we are except through what we would call the ancient mysteries and today the spiritual sciences. So he also says, AI will transform our economy, our culture, our politics, and even our own bodies and minds in ways most people can hardly imagine. Nanotech Im implants will augment human brains, creating a hybrid intelligence. So the hybrid intelligence is now a combination of machine intelligence and human intelligence. And you will be able to, supposedly, do a context switch in your mind to go out on the internet or whatever it is or to your uh, machine buddy that your brain computer interface implant in your brain, which is nanotechnology, will be able to function for you. These are the things. Here's a set of the books. The Singularity is Near, Near by Ray Kurzweil. His first book that gained all sorts of attention was called The Age of Spiritual Machines. And his most recent one is How to Create a Mind, The Secret of Human Thought Revealed. And some others here, Our Final Invention, sounds pretty scary about artificial intelligence. I really upset I wanted to coin this term, but somebody beat me to it. It's putting an H-E, so it's, you might read it, he, artificial intelligence, but when you read it properly, it's heart, heart. intelligence. And I'm predicting that we will, in the near future, not so many years from now, move from artificial intelligence to artificial soul in computers, where they will be imitating emotions. And we'll look at that a lot more um, tomorrow and a little bit more in today's. So you can see uh, Max O'Connell's To Be a Machine, for example. So there's lots in here. Now, Marvin Minsky, I mentioned before, he's since passed, but Marvin was uh, head of the Artificial Intelligence Lab at MIT, and he used to give tours with this, you know, we're all carbon chauvinists, and he put out a book called The Society of Mind, where he talks about each synapse not having any mind of itself, but that all of these small, tiny components, how they're put together gives us the sense of mind. Now he would say that there is no ghost in us, there's no special other ingredient than the physical nature that gives us consciousness and mind. And through that, lots of his students have gone on and are some of the authors you just saw, but one in particular, Nick Bostrom, uh, has really created a stir. He, he works with Ray Kurzweil and the book called Superintelligence, where it says, uh, if machines, if machine brains surpass human brains in general intelligence, then this new superintelligence could replace humans as the dominant form of life on Earth. Sufficiently intelligent machines could improve their own capabilities faster than human computer scientists and the outcome would be an existential catastrophe for humans. Superintelligence would be difficult to control or restrain. And so people like Elon Musk and many others are saying, oh, we better put up some controls on artificial intelligence. We better put some kind of, of architectural, in the software architecture, some sort of boundaries and so on so that 
such catastrophes don't occur. And all the computer scientists are going, yeah, right, as if that's <laughs> really going to happen. It did that. With the biological things in Cambridge, they put constraints on biological experimentation. So they did also <laughs> on human genome and yes. human gene editing, and they just ended it. They ended that. Yes, they just ended it in part because China was doing it and we were afraid we were going to fall behind. So I want to bring up Jennifer Gidley. She actually helped bring about Steiner School uh, curriculum to this, the uh, Australian state schools. Um, and she, as a professor at the University of Technology in Sydney, the Institute for Sustainable Futures, uh, has been talking about this divergence that's happened in the technological fields where one, um, the transhumanists are dehumanizing and she goes into uh, a lot on, on what they're doing and you can imagine what that is and a more human-centered, humanitarian approach. And she's getting a lot of traction. A lot of people are reading her and, and buying into what she's bringing. So she is one of the big voices out there in this. Um, so let's compare Ray Kurzweil, who is the leading authority for the transhumanists, who would say, we're going to transcend biology, our fragile biological systems, by merging with non-biological systems. This merger um, of our biological thinking and existence will happen with our technology. And by 2030, man will be less human and more machine. Bodies filled with nanorobots and artificially enhanced and all this other kind of stuff. And Time Magazine came out uh, about a year ago, front cover 2045, which is actually a, uh, an entity by a Russian, one end, Dmitry uh, Itzkov, and you can pull up a chair, or there's one up here if you're capable. But <clears throat> um, so, so there's a lot of work towards this unification, this merging. Rudolf Steiner would say the welding together of human beings with machines will be a great and important problem for the rest of human evolution. If you're wondering where that came from, I have all of these. Uh, citations there, the wrong and right use of esoteric knowledge, um, lecture three. Also, man will chain a second being to him. So this is 19, roughly 1905 in the temple legend lectures, where he's already seeing this coming of this merging and this attaching of machines to the human being. Man will chain a second being to him. Not that he's saying this is good, by the way. <laughs> Feel the urge to think materialistic thoughts, to think not through his own being, but through the second being, who is his companion. Now, if that doesn't, to me, that sounds just like these brain-computer interfaces back in 1905. Our science must lead the way must prepare for what has to happen with the bodily essence in the future. And we're going to explore that tonight. What you think today, that you will be tomorrow. He says that's an aphorism from ancient India. And he goes, it's still true. So we are in what's called the fifth post-Atlantean cultural age in esoteric lore. And in this one, in the course of this, Steiner talks about um, there will be so many problems uh, that have lost all inner vital warmth. Countless questions which confront us <clears throat> when we study spiritual science with any depth simply do not exist for modern man with his materialistic outlook. A different form of experience will come to the man of modern times. And he goes on, I have to be using his intellect to establish the interconnections between its phenomena and believes that all its riddles can be solved in this materialistic way. 
Um, but this way of working coarsens and dries up his etheric body. Now, if you're not familiar with what that term means in this esoteric lore, the human being is composed of a physical body, a life body, life that we share with the plant kingdom, then an, what is called an astral body, um, which is the seat of our consciousness, something that we share with the animal kingdom where we can uh, experience our emotions, our inner life. And then we have a fourth entity, which some call the I or the I am, uh, the human spirit, which is the eternal part of us in esoteric lore. So like a second nature, um, these uh, will attach themselves to the human being, talking about these aramonic entities. Now, it's interesting, Humanification is a book by the son of an anthroposophist whose name is Kees Kolme, uh, a Danish name, and I'm not sure if I pronounce it right. Uh, but he talks about go digital, um, I think it says remain human. Um, sorry about that, we can't turn out the light or I disappear on the camera. <laughs> uh, and then, um, uh, this book by uh, Huval Noah Harari is making a lot of, uh, it's called Homo Deus, and it's also a book about a future time when the <coughs> biological species of humans will be gone. So it's subtitled A Brief History of Tomorrow. So the question out there is, what happens if we no longer have a physical body? What happens to spiritual science? What happens to all sorts of different uh, religious and <coughs> spiritual backgrounds if we have no physical body. So <clears throat> let's take a look at uh, the machine as an extension of the body. Um, I can say that we already, when you get into a car as the driver, you experience something about your being filling something of the you might call it the space of the car. And guys are particularly prone to do this where we get familiar with the engine noise and if there's something wrong, we know it because it sounds different. And we also know when the shocks are going, right guys, you know? And you know, we feel every bump and you know, that, that pothole shouldn't be there, but you know. Um, so we begin to, sh to reveal to ourselves that we actually can feel comfortable in a machine. It's not so far-fetched that we might actually, like in the movie Avatar, be able to go into some robotic machine that moves around for us or that we are inside of it. And MIT and others are working on wearable robotics. So we'll explore that a little bit more. Um, but what are machines really for? And I'm going to propose that their role has been emancipation. Emancipation in the past from physical labor, and now they're moving into the emancipation of mental labor. Mm -hmm. And Rudolf Steiner had predicted that 90%, 1905 again, 90% of the jobs that existed then, of course, will be gone to machines. When? In the f near few, you know, he was sort of talking about this century that we're in. It's already been happening. So I'm going to draw a little picture here, and it is a parabola that's pointing down, and uh, not to scale, but it shows earlier parts of Earth evolution according to esoteric lore. Um, there's earlier ones in what's called Hyperborean, but at that time, physical existence could be at most what in astronomy we would call a nebula. But even that is going too far into the physical. And these substances, if you will, began to separate and 
in astronomy, we would say gravity pulled and formed the sun. In esoteric lore, they would actually say that the sun is a kind of counter space, and this sort of substance is now there as the substance of the interior of the sun. Um, it's way too far to go down that path tonight, so I'll just bear with me on that. And then um, the more coarser or physical substances were left behind to form the planets. A condensation is continuing, and the Hyperborean is actually a recapitulation of earlier planetary conditions. And sorry, you joined us late, but we talked about how there were, uh, in, in astronomy, the equivalence is what they call metallicity, which they talk about how do we get the heavy metals today? Well, we must have had previous incarnations of the solar system. And the number that astronomy comes up with, or astrophysics, is three prior ones, which interesting lines up with what esoteric or spiritual science talks about as well. So this recapitulation is of an earlier period um, when the sun then departs. The moon departure is during a period of time of Lemurian. And again, there's nothing about a human form that exists in this time. At most, we could say it might have something like an, uh, the consistency of an octopus or a jellyfish or something. But, um, and even then, until the moon departed, it was becoming very difficult for human beings to incarnate. All of the incarnations at that time were into bodies that were both male and female. We had not had the separation of the sexes. So the offspring looked just like the parents. We're kind of a clone of the parents. So we'll see about that. But um, when the moon then departs, Earth evolution can change because what goes with the moon is not this watery, life-flexible substances, but more of the hardening characteristics of the Earth. And so then souls are able to start coming back, and with that departure, we have the separation of the sexes. That point in, um, is, is uh, the period of Cain and Abel. We still do not have a sexual procreation until we get to Atlantean times, which biblically is the time of Seth, when sexual procreation begins. And then we get to Earth Man, the period um, of post-Atlantean times. Now, once we pass the middle of evolution, spiritual beings that have been guiding us become and I hate to use this word, but eligible for advancement. And so beings of the archangels can move up to the archai. Being of the archai can move up to the Elohim or the exousiae. And likewise, the exousiae can move on up to the dynamis. So the new beings taking on as the uh, beings who control human forms and other forms are new beings. These were once the archai, and they totally respect human freedom. They're not going to intervene. But like other beings that are respecting this, if we rise to them, we can interact with them so that um, we can work with them towards this future evolution. I mentioned um, the being Michael. Uh, or Mikael, uh, who is now uh, of the archangels, one of those who is moving on to the archai. He is currently what's called the time spirit that we're in. And um, Rudolf Steiner mentions from 1879 on, beings who have not been part of Earth evolution are now coming to help with Earth evolution. And we'll talk at the very end about some of those. And the reason is, is that now starts the process towards that future solar system, which in esoteric lore is called Jupiter.
So back to our diagram again, starting the ascent from the fourth post-Atlantean cultural age into the fifth, which we're in now. Um, we'll then move to the sixth, which is all, often called the Slavic period. I don't know why that showed up. <laughs> Sorry, just a minute. I got it. Hopefully that's better. Okay. Um, incarnation, Rudolf Steiner says, will end around the year 6000 AD, which is in the sixth post-Atlantean cultural age, the seventh and last post-Atlantean cultural age um, will conclude with the moon returning. And just before that, Steiner talks about a war of all against all, and also about something that seems very scary until you realize that incarnation had already ended about 2,000 years earlier, and that is that the earth will be infested, maybe is a word, by an electronic mass within or upon which, it's not exactly clear, there will be beings that will resemble something like spiders. And it's interesting, a lot of anthroposophists point, oh my God, we've got those already, don't we? We have the name spiders that are out there on the internet, these crawlers that go into your website and find out who your references are and so on. <laughs> so, um, but these spiders will be, you might say, the playground for humanity because in the next period, we will be beings who will be able to endow something with life. We will be creating plant forms. We don't create plant forms today with our genetic editing, but we will be able to create new plant forms at that time. And so the spidery beings will actually be, uh, you might say these robotic entities that we will be endowing with a little bit of life so that they exist between the mineral and the plant kingdom. Then we go on to the uh, epochs, okay, so all of this was post-Atlantean epoch, and uh, the fifth, and then we go to the sixth, and then the seventh, <coughs> when the sun returns. When the moon returns, I think time, as we know it, will also change considerably. Um, these epochs have seven um, internal ages within them. And in our times, each one of those is roughly 2,160 years. So, Rudolf Steiner and other uh, lore talk about uh, what the human being needs to do in order to be free of a physical body. And part of that is to be able to rise up in your consciousness to this level called manas in Sanskrit or this um, spirit um, self in, in anthroposophical terms. And that is a control of all of these emotions that happen in what is called the astral body. Now, the story of Prometheus is a story of how that can be done. So Prometheus is chained to the mineral kingdom. And something gnaws at his organ, an eagle in some, a vulture in others. The liver is the etheric organ of the human being. It is the representative organ of the etheric body. Now, how do we become free of being chained to the mineral kingdom? Well, there's deeds that have to be done, and this is represented by Heracles or Hercules, where by the 12 labors, he becomes godlike. He knows what the gods know at that level of the zodiac. But that's still not enough. The inner centaur, our animal nature, has to be sacrificed before we can completely live without the physical body. 
So, okay, I'm not going to worry about that, most will say. That's a long time from now. I know I ain't getting there this lifetime, right? So maybe next lifetime I'll work on a little, maybe the one after that a little more. And I probably got 20,000 years, maybe 2 million, who knows, you know. I don't know how many incarnations. Well, whoops, there's only 4,000 years left. If you do the math, Rudolf Steiner points out in karmic relationships, it seems that it's right now about 700 years between incarnations. And before that, it was only two every 2,161 as a man and one as a woman. Um, so that, that's only about five or six more incarnations to clean up your karma and get to this point where you can do without a physical body. So when Steiner also talks about a period of time, he actually uses the word 2,500 years, when we will essentially be without our physical bodies, but still be present in physical earthly incarnations. And during that period of time, it will be very important for those who have advanced to help those who have not. So, going into this temple legend, lecture 10, which I know the Inghams were just reading at their house, there is a chart that goes with lecture 10, and this chart has caused enormous confusion for anthroposophists. So here you see, um, and this would be using theosophical terminology, the different seven conditions, um, and then the seven great epochs. We saw Hyperborea, Lemuria, Atlantis, and our current one, and then a sixth epoch and a seventh. And this present one is divided up into seven cultural, and unfortunately, they use the word epoch. And so it creates all sorts of confusion because the translator will say epoch, and people won't know, are we up here? Or are we down here? And hence, that's led to um, a confusion as to when the cessation of physical incarnation occurs, which is in the sixth cultural epoch, and the return of the moon right after this war of all against all, the end of the seventh one. I suspect the reason why that happened had to do with perhaps the artist getting confused. I don't know, but it's, it's created a lot of confusion. So why do I say it's coming up? Well, there's several places in the year 6000, there's several places that Rudolf Steiner brings this up. And one is um, in this lecture from 2005 also called Evolution of Human Freedom and Personal Consciousness. He describes how in each of these post-Atlantean cultural ages, the time at which the human body can no longer service the soul can no longer bring this wisdom from the body to the soul is moving downwards. We are getting younger and younger in this regards. And so every one of those archangel periods, we lose a year. So those archangel periods are roughly 310 years. And so there will be seven of them in each one of these. So you can see we lose seven years here from 56 to 49 during the ancient Indian. Today, we're moving from 27 to 21. And in the time of Christ, it was at 33, which interestingly is the age at which he was crucified. I, I'm, I'm, I'm lost here. What, what are those numbers representing? The age at which the body has expired what it can give to the soul for soul development. Okay, and the soul's relationship to the body then. So it's, it's, um, it, it's also important when we get down here to the seventh that we will already have fallen past the, below the age of puberty. So that's another reason why Steiner says that women will be, be infertile then by that year 6,000. And it will be beginning as early as 4,000, 6,000 AD. But it will be beginning as early as the year 4,000. And we're going to ask the question later, has it already begun? As a lot of these things begin 
in some senses way before they are actually totally physically manifesting. Okay, I'll take a couple questions, but it'd be good to hold most of them to the end, but go ahead. Is yeah. this because the physical body has nothing to offer, or because the soul cannot learn? Um, it's, it is because the physical body has nothing more to offer. It's also because the soul can no longer learn from the body. Both are happening. Is, is the soul put more on its own? Like, we're pushed out, so we have to be stronger on our own. Yes, we do have to be stronger on our own, but we will still lose this connection. Mm -hmm. It is part of what is necessary in human evolution that this occur. But there's other th places. In um, The Fall of the Spirits of Darkness, Lecture 5, he says, in a time not all that far ahead, possibly as early as the seventh millennium, all women will be infertile on earth. Oh. All women will be infertile on earth. He also talks in that lecture about the withering and crumbling of human bodies that will have, has already begun. And he talks also about before the earth has gone through all of its stages, this has to occur because human beings have to deal with this ending of the earth. It's part of our destiny to deal with that. People would no longer find anything to do on earth if life stayed as it is. We can't conserve life as it is because when we are looking to incarnate, we won't find anything interesting anymore. We will only find, you know, that could be kind of nice. I can sit back on my couch and watch movies my whole life. Cool. I'm in on that. No, that won't happen from the spiritual world perspective. So we have to find different ways. The final stages of Earth evolution will make it necessary for these people incarnating to do without physical bodies and yet be present on Earth. So a very interesting statement. Still dealing with the physical Earth but without a physical body. But we would have our etheric body. So we'll come to that, yes. So from the lecture, Some Conditions for Understanding Supersensible Experiences, this is from 1920. A time will come in the physical evolution of the Earth. It will be after the year 5,700. He actually gives a date now, not just a millennium. 5,600. When, if he fulfills his rightful evolution, man will no longer tread the earth by incarnating in bodies derived from physical parents. Now that leaves the door open to a form of eugenics. Sorry to use that word, but that's, we're not talking about 1920s eugenics. <laughs> but essentially forming bodies that people can incarnate into. And Rudolf Steiner, as we will hear more tomorrow, points to the Slavic people for developing that. But he talks about in that epoch coming up, this sixth millennium, women will be barren, children will no longer be born in the manner of today if evolution on the earth takes its normal course. Now human beings, interestingly, with the help of Araman, can prevent that. So aramonic powers, which under the influence of impulses working in men today, are becoming extremely strong and might succeed in preventing Earth evolution in a certain respect. I don't want you to get scared. <laughs> it would then become possible for men, by no means for their good, to be held in the same form of physical life beyond this time of the sixth millennium. So Steiner's telling us it's not a good thing. Can we read the rest of it? Can you go back? Well, we've got to keep moving. One of the endeavors of the aramonic powers is to keep humanity fettered too long to the earth in order to divert it from its normal evolution. So I can't read everything on all the slides, sorry, but that's why they're available. So how long is this going to take, as I mentioned just a little earlier, 2,500 years, roughly speaking, which means that there's a lead in and maybe a little bit on the end, but 
we're going to have to deal with how to be on the physical earth, how to help those who need to be on the physical earth for a good 2,500 years. We're not abandoning them. So another quote from Steiner, the sixth post-Atlantean cultural age, human fertility, which depends on powers of light for its impulses, will gradually come to an end. The powers of darkness will have to intervene so the affair may continue for a while. The powers of darkness. Now, you're getting scared or not scared? This is getting interesting. Seeds for the sixth paca lie in the east of Europe with the Slavic people. Development of powerful tendencies which do not allow physical human reproduction to continue beyond the sixth post-Atlantean cultural age. Let the earth enter into a form of existence in soul and spirit, and this gets closer to what you're saying. The other impulse for the seventh post-Atlantean cultural age, which is sometimes called the American one, in which procreation will be guided by impulses from the cast down angels, will come from America. So a question, what is he talking about? What kind of physical bodies or vehicles are we talking about here? So another picture of this parabola shows that we went through a golden age. And um, now I can't remember the Sanskrit names for these different yugas, but a gold, silver, bronze, and then Kali Yuga, the dark age. And just to give some uh, time frame, Abraham would have been sort of near the beginning of the dark age. Moses also um, a little bit into that. Kali Yuga period, which lasts for roughly 5,100 years. Some very interesting things with all of these ages. So, interestingly, parallel to the body and the soul running out of gas, so to speak, um, in the fourth century, early Christians pointed to that as the end of the earth. Steiner describes that as the end of when the earth could feed the human soul. It's the end of the time when, when you breathed the air through yoga and other exercises, your air that you breathed was ensouled, that you could feel the experience of spiritual beings entering and exiting you through the breath. And that ended in the fourth century, interestingly, at the same time when the ancient mysteries were destroyed by Roman soldiers and mobs of Christians, bringing the end of the ancient mysteries. Then in the 15th century, we reach another kind of bottom of the parabola in terms of human consciousness development. And um, we can talk about that, uh, but I, I, another time. Now, if we look backwards, uh, Steiner mentions that this being Lucifer, the light bearer, actually had an incarnation around the year 3000 BC in what is today China. And through Lucifer, we have the ancient mysteries. Through Lucifer, we have the sciences and the arts. Through Lucifer, we have the wisdom that human beings have as their possession. But Lucifer brought more than that, of course. And so um, the focus back in these times was to overcome what Lucifer brought, but to take the crown jewel from that. Now, as we look ahead to post-Kali Yuga, which we've begun, we will have in the early in the third millennium, which we are now in, an incarnation of this prince of darkness in Persian lore called Araman, who is the balance to Lucifer. And so now, is the time to be preparing for confronting Araman, just as beings had to prepare for overcoming Lucifer. And we can also say, 
I think, this is me saying, I will say this, I'm sorry, that in that overcoming of Lucifer, we were dealing with the able stream and looking backwards to a more glorious past for humanity. All of this was being pushed down and each one of these stages was considered by humanity a catastrophe that was happening to them without their wish. The catastrophes of the future are not to be done by the gods because this is the time of human freedom. It will be we doing it to ourselves. And Araman would love for us to not have that war, would love for us to become chained to this mineral kingdom like Prometheus and not be able to free ourselves. So this is actually the role of Cain and the work of the Cain stream is towards this future. But I don't want you to think that these are separable. It's actually important for the future temple building as we will get to. So we will get to what that's happening. So at that turning point in time, it wasn't one individual that was crucified on Golgotha. And here you see the skull of Adam at the base or under the cross of the Christ. But there were two others. And this one, in this painting by Montegno, Andrea Montegno, you see one in the light and one in the darkness of the other two crucified. This one represents the past or the Lucifer from whence the light bearer. Oops, sorry. <laughs> and this one, the future, that comes out of the darkness. So Solomon built a temple, and we talked about Cain stream and Abel stream, and the Cain stream gets us Hiram Abiff, who builds the temple for Solomon, who comes from the Abel stream. Now, these lores, all these spiritual lores from India and so on, talk about a future time when humanity will transform their physical body into Atman or Atma. So it's a big question. If we no longer have physical bodies, do we have to reach Atma before the year 6000? Well, that one we definitely can't do. That's not for way far in the future. But there will be beings who will try to offer it to us too early. So what did Jesus mean when he answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it in three days? So here's an artist's picture of Solomon's temple, uh, the first temple. And it was destroyed by the Babylonians around the year 587 BC. Then when the Jews were released from Babylonia, they came back and under Zerubbabel, they built the second temple as an imitation of the first. This then was added onto by King Herod and then the Romans destroyed that in the year 70 AD. And there's all sorts of esoteric groups, secret or otherwise, who are all concerned about the third temple and who will get to build it because if it's built on Mount Moriah, the Dome of the Rock is there. What does Islam have to do with all of this? And a mosque is there. So even though Israel owns you know, this, they can't legally build there. And there's people that are just waiting for that mosque to be destroyed so they can. So what is this third temple? And ignore Shefa's talk, that's <laughs> from a different moment. Anyways, um, if we look at that first temple, we have Solomon, we, and Solomon is able to come up with a concept, you might say the blueprint. Um, he's able to be the receiver. In this sense, he is an able stream. But he can't build it. He has to go to Hiram, and Hiram has that know-how. He's the blue-collar guy of those era. And he, he, he knows how to do that. 
Um, for, for Solomon, um, it's the relationship is important of myself to God. In Hiram, it's the future is community with God. It's a different feel sort of to that. Mm -hmm. in, in Solomon and in in, um, Abel, it's to receive out of reverence, out of the abundance of God. He leadeth me. I don't need to do anything. So one develops a cool detachment to all that is given. You have gratitude, but there isn't this enthusiasm needed. On the Hiram side, the Cain side, it's out of deed. It's out of spiritualizing, tilling the earth that is their motivation and they do it with enthusiasm. They're the ones that have that inner fire. They're the ones who receive from Prometheus the fire for the arts and the sciences and the ability to transform. They're the ones that are building the robots too. So the symbol for here, for the able, would be the upward pointing isosceles triangle. And for the Cain Hiram, it's the downward pointing. But there's a third being, Balkus. And Balkus comes when the, building, in the temple is being built as the queen of Sheba. She crosses over the wood that was not used in the temple. As we know in the temple legend, this is the wood that later would be used for the cross but it's also the wood that Seth is able to retrieve from the Garden of Eden and plant essentially on Adam's grave. And as you saw in the crucifixion, Adam's skull was at the base of the cross. So she comes. And she's heard about this wisdom of Solomon. He's been famous all over the region. She comes in and it's described that she sees him as the most beautiful statue she's ever seen. It's an important statue. And she immediately decides to marry him without fire. And later she asks to see the building of this and then the workmen, and then who's leading the workmen. And on a first glimpse of Hiram, she becomes a girl on fire. <laughs> She's got to have them. And she does. It's arranged. And Balkis slips away when she gets Solomon drunk, takes off her wedding ring, and spends the night with Hiram. And the next day, Hiram is killed by his three assistants. So we get this transformation of these two different triangles to overlap in Balkus. But she represents the soul and its change in its focus downwards to the earth. And it is us, in us, that we unite these two and have to bring up through, in a sense, the cane stream to build this temple of the future that the able stream in us, and we could even say the masculine has to build this future temple for the feminine to populate it. Could what say to that? populate it, the feminine to populate it, the able in us to populate oh, I it. I like that. Mm. that. Okay, you don't have to like it. Okay, no. <laughs> I'm showing a picture right now uh, of a mosaic of Cain and Abel, and it's interesting. You know, Abel's, as you all know, sacrifice was accepted. Um, that I'm going to leave for you to sort of just ponder what that all meant. But what's important is Cain slays Abel. The masculine slays the feminine. The kingly stream slays the priestly stream. And we've been a masculine society since. And those have to come together. In the soul realm, this is happening, yes.
So I have a picture here of this transition time showing circles representing the physical body, the etheric body, the astral, and the ego with those shaded in, saying this is what represents the human being, with the three that are the triangle of Hiram that he was given, that we've been talking about, the development to spirit self, then later to life spirit, known as Bodhi, this was known as Manas, and finally Atma spirit man. How do we get from this picture to this picture and in the next picture, I'm showing the physical body separating from the overlapping circles of the first picture. And the shading moves up one. So now, Manas becomes part of our constitution, but the physical falls off. But we have a dotted line around this because we are becoming in it. And interestingly, this is also the diagram of an angel who no longer has a physical body. Angels don't have physical bodies. Their lowest member is the etheric body. What happens then to the temple? When Christ said, in three days I will build this up, how can we do that if we no longer have a physical body? I love this picture of Hiram with his blueprint, and on the blueprint is a beehive. As part of the temple, or as an image of the temple of the future. And that one you can ponder, why the beehive? So, I mentioned that we might be given these way too soon. And that's, that offer will be given to us. Will we arrive too soon? The picture shows two human beings now in heaven, and the caption says, most of the new arrivals seem incapable of conversation. They just stare at their hands in despair. And their hands are trying to use their thumbs on their iPhones, but they have no iPhones in heaven. So how do we develop the strength? We have to overcome obstacles. Obstacles are given to us to build strength of soul. And so, just before old moon, which is the previous planetary condition, the previous solar system, the Godhead decreed that there shall be obstacles for those on the human stage and commanded that Beings from the dynamis, which is the spirits of movement, down, and that's, they're in the middle um, of the second hierarchy, um, become beings of hindrance. We can't really speak yet of evil until we get to the human, uh, the earthly time. But it caused a lot of angels to fall before old moon manifested, or as it was manifesting, there was Santa calls the war in heaven. And the result of that is the ast major asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. And lots on that, which I can't possibly go into here, but it's important to try to get this full picture. Um, and so on this prior planetary condition called Old Moon, we can ask what was different than our condition today? Well, there's no physical substance. So you can't even call it water by the way we think of water, but it would have been fluidy as its lowest substance. Um, and beings that are now angels developed there. And when they reached their midpoint and were starting like we are today, starting to prepare for Earth, just as it's happening for us as we've reached that midpoint, the beings who will lead that transition and the beings who will be human at the next human stage, meaning Earth, arrive on old moon and we were a horrible nuisance when the angels of today were at the human stage. And they are our guardian 
beings who will follow us no matter what we do, no matter what evil we do, they'll stick with us. And they will fall if we fall. Now that's a pretty amazing feeling. Are you capable of doing that? Can you imagine doing that for some aramonic being who at best can be in a machine and you're going to love them that way? Well, we've got a lot of time ahead, right? So Steiner brings up this end of physical incarnation. Let's check what's going on today with fertility. Here's a chart from, um, I forget where I pulled this from. Um, it shows in Africa, if you go back to the 1950s to 60s, the birth rate per woman was about seven children, fertility rate. And that has fallen now to under three. If it falls to 2.3, we reached zero population growth. This is, but it's, Africa. where is this? Which Africa, that was Africa. Oh. The rest of the world has long been under three. Oh. And the civilized world has been well under two per woman. If it weren't for immigrants, to Europe and America, we would have long since passed zero population growth. Like Japan. No, no. Like Japan. This has Thank so you. much to do, though, with egotism. And people not I, I, I actually, I, I agree. There's lots of reasons. I'm not going to go into the reasons. I'm only putting it out there as a, quote, data point of where this is going. So for lots of reasons, fertility is already falling, but women aren't infertile. It's a choice. Freedom of humanity has been bringing down the fertility rate. Now, there's articles that say millennials prefer pets to babies. They're cheaper. And they love us more. So here's an interesting thing. Where industrialization and modern culture have come, you suddenly get a drop, and this has been accelerating. So this kind of lines up with what Ray Kurzweil is saying, but now a, an exponential chart for the amount of time it takes to go from seven children to fewer than three children. And it took the UK from 1815 to 1910. It took Iran starting in 1986 to 1996, only 10 years. So you can see it's all across the world now. The fall of fertility is going on. And if this continues for even five more years, we will pass zero population growth in the world. But we will still have 10 billion people or whatever it is. We'll have more people, perhaps, depending on who you're listening to, than the Earth can sustain. Now, we talked about emancipation from physical labor and from mental labor. What about birthing labor? Well, we already have cesarean section, but can we go further than that? What's going on in the whole field of birthing? Well, CRISPR, as you probably have heard, is the acronym for a gene editing machine. And we were talking before we began about how human gene editing was allowed in China, disallowed in Western countries until recently when we were afraid we were falling behind China, so we began to allow it just in the last few months. So human gene editing is underway in the West as well. And what it will allow us to do is to edit out what we don't like, what we think is bad, and put in what we think is better or the best. Designer babies, right? And designer babies would not be far away. In fact, there's all sorts of things on the docket now to try to overcome. 
Of course, diseases are primary on that because they believe they can sell those. But um, what does that do to perhaps, um, you know, uh, when we've looked at what we've done for gene editing with plants, there have been mutations out in the field. And we've also seen that pigweed adapts and starts taking over the same fields because it becomes immune to Roundup. So synthetically today, we can take skin cells and turn them into stem cells. When I went out to the annual general meeting of the Anthroposophical Society in Phoenix recently, the person who sat next to me on the plane was going out to a large conference of some 7,000 of these people who get together for uh, biomedical engineering. And gene editing is the biggest thing, and they use CRISPRs for these. And they're very excited about creating from skin cells human clones in the test tube. Now, I don't have the slide, but we've already created an artificial womb. And we've been growing animals in artificial wombs. Currently, we only do it in the last trimester. But the scientists say we should be able to do it the whole way through. What does that mean to, shall we say, <laughs> that human being who is grown in an artificial womb compared to a natural womb? What is that relationship to mother? How does that change? Now, I'm scaring you. I don't mean to. I just, <laughs> all these things have to be pointed out what's coming. So um, we also see that there's been um, uh, investments towards embryo farms. And we've had uh, a case, yeah, the three parent babies is legal in England for a woman who has quote, bad mitochondria, she can go into the lab and have another woman donate her egg. They cut out the good mitochondria, cut out her bad, put the good over the bad, and then fertilize the egg. And once it's established, then they can put it into her womb, and she can grow now a baby that won't have mitochondrial diseases. But when we get to these embryo farms, we'll be able to fertilize hundreds, thousands of eggs. And then you can go in and pick the one you want to bring to term, not necessarily in your own body. We already have surrogates. We have what? Surrogate mothers. Yeah. But who will incarnate into these? Uh, Correct. Will people want to incarnate? What will be incarnating? So before we throw the baby out with the bath water, <laughs> um, <clears throat> you can see what might be coming. If we no longer want to incarnate into a test tube baby and these sorts of things, will we want to incarnate? Will it be acceptable to incarnate with a developed etheric body that has been hardened to be able to do this, can we drop into an adult robotic body and skip childhood altogether? All of this, Steiner talks about beings who have been responsible for birth and death. And they are under these higher beings, and I, I can't tell you exactly what levels we're talking about here, but these beings of birth and death have to be beings that can deal with physical matter. Yes. And so by the ending of birthing, it frees up these beings. And Steiner says that these beings freed up are going to go into technology, 
an industry. The birthing pains of bringing a company to existence or the pain of <laughs> dying, your company dying like Sears and pennies and so on. <clears throat> I don't know. It's probably going to be worse than that. But it will be as if the denser part of man, that I'm quoting from Steiner, were here below on earth and the human being will make use of it from outside like an instrument. Man will no longer bear his body about and live within it, but will float above it. The body will itself have become rarefied and finer, an etheric body will be our lowest member. That's from 1907. Only then do we gain knowledge of the true inner life and we learn to recognize that our real self, our higher I, is widely extended over the world around us. The only external world is now our own body. So meditation influences the work of the astral body upon the physical and etheric bodies during the night. Only benefit, benefit, beneficent beings must be allowed access to the human being. He who seeks initiation must achieve the utmost calm. This includes the avoidance of all stimulants, especially alcohol, towards this development. The relation of the astral body to the physical body is like that of a workman to his machine. But with the difference that in this case the workman is in the machine. He ensouls the various parts and makes them move. The resemblance of worker to machine applies even better when the person lies asleep. The astral body then works from outside. What does it do? It makes good the damage suffered by the physical body during the day. That's from the Gospel of St. John in 1906. So, again, this question, how can we build the temple? The head above and that we stand on the earth with a heart in between. We've seen the Abel Seth legacy and the Cain legacy. They bring what is above came from what is beneath, the wisdom of each together. So the Seth Abel, I am a son of God, the Cain, I am raising my self into the community. So one meditation that can help us to be able to experience the beings who are here, I mentioned, who are here to help us. And Serena says, we don't allow them in. We're rude to them. <laughs> we don't give them a place to work in our evolution. So the meditation one can do is to imagine yourself where you are an image of the cosmos above, the stars above, that are fixed stars, and it becomes the dome above as the temple. The walls of the temple is your imagination of the moving stars, the planets, the sun and moon, and the foundation of the temple is the earth. And in this temple, you can invite these beings. You can invite in the beings um, such as the Christ and these other spiritual beings here to assist our future evolution. So back to this parabola and the different epochs and cultural ages. We have talked about Hephaestus, I'm sorry, about Prometheus, and Hephaestus is the one who builds 
the uh, chains that hold Prometheus to the mineral kingdom. He's also the god of technology. He builds automatons. He builds robots that go up and down Olympus. And when he's finally invited back, and there's all sorts of other things he does, um, when he's finally invited back to Olympus, like Jesus riding into Jerusalem, he rides in on a donkey. So there were beings back here who had gone with the sun way back here in the Hyperborean period of time who were then pushed out but at a time when no planet could be given to them. They are the homeless spirits called the Vulcan beings that exist between, in a geocentric model, between the moon sphere and the next sphere, which esoterically is called Mercury. And that's because when we went from a geocentric model to a heliocentric model, Mercury and Venus names were switched. So that gets confusing. Which is the... Sorry, the question is? Venus and Mercury. We're switched. switched. When we went from a geocentric to a heliocentric model. Okay, so they, these Vulcan beings are the ones that are now trying to enter into earthly evolution to help us prepare for this moon return. As Vulcan beings, they understand technology. And so it's no accident that Spock was called a Vulcan. The artists of this period are seeing the future. Elon Musk? What about Musk? Is he a Vulcan? No. No, they do not incarnate into physical bodies. None of the Vulcans can do that. So they have to work with us in our temple. We have to invite them into the temple for them to work with us. So they've been arriving, according to Steiner, the Vulcan beings since 1880. They seek to be the forerunners of the end of the earth and the return of the moon. We can only understand their speech through spiritual science. And the human race does not welcome these beings. And so for the, us to wake up, he says, we're going to have to endure shock after shock until we wake up to them. Doesn't sound very pleasant, does it? It's, it's happening. Can I so, a yeah. So, just, just to throw in, so someone like Steve Jobs in the light of what you're saying, pushing us forward, or is he? he he's right on time. For evolution. He's doing, he's, doing what he was he's doing exactly what he was supposed to do. Really? Wow. Did a good job. Yeah, because what did he do? He turned the computer from a cold, aramonic supercomputer into a personal computer. That has its other effects, but he brought Lucifer into this aramonic mechanical entity. I never, I worked for IBM, and until that Macintosh came out, I had never heard the expression through all the mini computers and, and the beginning personal computers, everybody hated them. And with the Macintosh, I heard for the first time, I love my Mac. <laughs> Lucifer. So there were oracles in these Atlantean times when these beings were coming back from these different planetary spheres. So Moon, Mercury, Venus, and so on. Only one was betrayed, and that was the Vulcan Oracle. And the Vulcan Oracle had prepared itself in secrecy for a future task. And this is now, but all during that period of time, it had to be preparing it. How was it Forsaken, Steiner doesn't say that I have found. But he does talk about how the sons of God 
the Abel stream, found the daughters of men, the Cain stream, to be fair and took from them wives. Essentially, they fell for, for sexuality when they were not supposed to. And out of that came the Rakshasas, who are the ones who brought the evils in the Atlantean times, the giants amongst men, that was the reason why Atlantis had to be destroyed. Could you are we? Repeat that? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> During this Atlantean time, we have the Cain stream and the Abel stream. We do not have sexuality yet. Okay. Sexuality begins with Seth, okay, and sexuality then is going to enter those streams. They were supposed to stay separate, but the sons of God, the Abel stream, looked upon the daughters of men, the Cain stream, found them fair and took from them wives. And their offspring were what in Indian lore is called the Rakshasas, the giants amongst men. And there are fossil records of giants, supposedly. Yeah, titans? Tit no, titans are obviously, that's from before. Those are gods from before Zeus's time. So, um, and, and they bring the evils that Atlantis endured, but the evils that caused Atlantis to have to be destroyed. So if we're going to have as our lowest entity, the lowest member, the etheric body without the physical body, we better start preparing. And when we die, we know the <coughs> physical body and the etheric body do separate. And the physical body is given back to nature to be dissolved. And the etheric body lasts longer, but it too dissolves back into the cosmic ether. It is only in the 20th century that a, a renewal of, of the Christ event will take place, for this is when a certain general heightening of human powers of cognition begins. It brings with it the possibility that in the course of the next 3,000 years, so 3,000 plus 2,000, okay, years, and without special clairvoyant preparation, more and more persons will be able to attain a direct vision of this Christ Jesus, but not with the physical eyes, but an etheric being that the disciples also experienced. So as our etheric body is loosening already, and already we are capable of spiritual experiences, but because of all of our education being so materialistic, we don't listen to those sensory perceptions. And if we do hear them or see them, we ignore them or we dismiss them. And that has to change. We have to start waking up um, to all of that. I'm, I mentioned 2,000 years we've come, another 3,000 years, that sounds like that 5,000 years that we saw of Kali Yuga. It's interesting wherever that comes from. Um, but in 3,000 years, it'll be the year 5,000. 700 years after that, Steiner says, birthing will be very difficult, if at all. So in spiritual development, how do we, what, where do we need to get to in the next 3,000 years. We need to get to the fifth stage known as the myth, mystical death. And um, the body is then seen as the mother that he sees standing below him. And the transformed lower self is the disciple who bears witness that Christ lives. And now the higher self can say to the lower self, behold thy mother, the mother earth,
And then when we get to the sixth stage, that's the stage of burial and resurrection. Everything pertaining to this planet becomes the body of the Christian mystic. He feels as though the whole earth was part of him. He has ceased to be a separate being. He is one with the whole life of the earth. So this is telling you something about what's happening to the sense of physicality. And when we reach Atma, it's not our physical body, it's physicalness that we are transforming. It's the earth itself. And I'm sorry, that will go away. Thank you. So we've seen a fearsome future ahead, but we're not going to fear it, right? <laughs> Building the temple in the midst of infertility is going to be a difficult task. We need to invite these spiritual beings, in particular the Vulcans. He also mentions moon beings into our evolution, into our etheric temple, where we will also experience the etheric Christ. Preparing our future, we are doing according to divine will in doing all of this. And the cultivation of the mysteries of technology is a justified act by people of high moral intention. And this will go into more tomorrow, that this development of a moral technology is called on from the Americas. So we will be looking tomorrow at how that might be, what's already been looked at and how this might be furthered. I, I didn't get a chance to talk much about Hephaestus um, and we won't be able to do that tomorrow, but I have another whole lecture which we go into the Greek mythologies as a preparation for the times we're in. Oh, this one doesn't come out too well, but we're building a man-made world. Um, all of these things about technology apply to the man-made concepts of the world. But we have to build first this temple, and when we do so, we are like a child in our first attempts, and that's okay. So with the gifts of Araman, we will be able to actually do this. So when we look at Araman and what's coming, our confrontation with Araman is similar to what happened with Lucifer. There are gifts that we have to garner from this incarnation of Araman. As pointed out in many things, that future earthly, uh, future planetary condition called Jupiter is, will be known as a cosmos of love, where today when we go about nature, we see wisdom everywhere, that one will be love that is experienced. So this is something to consider. How do we start doing that? And remember, what you think today that you will be in the future. So just some further research into, is it robotic bodies that we're going to avatar when our lowest member is an etheric body? Um, Serner talks about the importance of countenance, that the countenance of a person, you will be able to tell whether they're a moral or an immoral person by their countenance. You can't hide. How, you cannot hide it. How will that be done if our lowest body is a robot? How will you reveal good or evil in that? I don't believe it will be. And another question which somebody else also raised, who can use these bodies? Is something else able to get into that? If our, my lowest body is uh, a, an etheric body, can a nasty angel jump in as well and do things in it that I don't intend? Can it be hacked? Uh -oh. <laughs> and some other human scary. jump in? <laughs> and then the question, what happens to my double? The double that incarnates with us when we're born and leaves just before death. What happens to that double? All interesting research we still have to do. And what are these Jupiter humans that Steiner has been talking about that are entering now? And he says, they enter where we're most unconscious in our will. We are 
totally unaware of them until we notice how lazy we're becoming. Or maybe you have teenagers today who you can say, yup, <laughs> that's where they are. So can we build a moral technology? And as I said, this will look at interfaces and as a driving force and the mechanized beast tomorrow. But it also begs the question, what is physical reality if we no longer have a physical body? Is physical reality what we think it is? And interestingly, a lot of scientists are saying it's not. And if you look for what happened was just said today out of CERN, our universe has no right to exist because whenever we create matter, we create antimatter, and the two should be combining, taking us back to nothing. Oh. 